Hi, welcome to TV Bookshelf. I'm Dave Lenander, and today I'm talking with Laurel Winter, Hi, who Dave. is the author of Growing Wings and a number of short stories, including one in Firebirds, and uh, has also received several awards and been a contender for still others. Um, Laurel, you started out as a, a poet pretty much, right? Yes, I mainly started writing short fiction. I was scared to death of long things. Even my, my short stories, wow, 800 words, woohoo. So the, the way that I actually got into novels was by accidentally starting a novel, and I'd take this short story to a writer's group, and they'd say, oh, no, that's a novel. So poetry was really my first love, and I just have my first uh, poetry collection. Or collection out. It's um, called A Galaxy in a Jar. Uh, illustrated by a local artist, Beth Hansen. So I'm really excited by that. It's uh, published by Dark Regions Press. And you read a couple of, of your poems in another episode of TV Bookshelf. That's correct. Um, but you have a new poem in uh, yeah, the have, latest issue of Asimov's, right? Yes, or? in the April-May one. Um, so it's called On Princesses, The Giant's Perspective. The ones who are already pinched in at the waist are easier to pick up but the ones with at least a bit of a belly have a better flavor. The shrieking used to bother me. I always took care of the end that had the mouth first, but I've gotten deaf with the years, so sometimes I start with the feet. The dragon replies, Now that I've made my fortune, I actually prefer a nice peasant. Saves me time picking through my droppings for gold and jewels. Plus, I de I've developed an allergy to silk, and a rough tunic adds a bit of fiber to my diet. A youngish peasant just after the harvest season? Ah. And another benefit. I can eat 30 or 40 peasants before a knight shows up. With princesses, the ratio is pretty much one to one. So, yeah, that's kind of fun. I've, I've uh, had good luck in Asimov's. Uh, two of the poems that I've had published in there have won me both um, Reisling Awards from the Science Fiction Poetry Association and the Asimov Reader's Poll Awards. Um, why Goldfish Shouldn't Use Power Tools, and Egg Horror Poem, which right. I know you're familiar with. Yeah, both of those poems. And those are both in Galaxy in, in a Jar. In collection, yes. Um, most of your poems uh, have a, a certain macabre humor to them, <laughs> um, and I'm sure that must be popular with uh, not only adult readers, but many of your uh, younger readers, too. Yeah, I, I think kids typically have kind of a dark sensibilities, you know, I think partially maybe comes from having no power and so <laughs> liking to see that the, the dark hidden side of things so um, I have one of my sons in particular is very fond he's when he watches movies like how come the bad guys never win <laughs> <laughs> so uh, but I, I do uh, when we started Lady Poetesses from Hell which is a reading group I, I on at science fiction conventions one of the reasons we started that is because Jane Yolen I'd read some particularly horrific poem and you know I look like a fairly nice person Jane Yolen would look at the audience and say and she has such a sweet face <laughs> so that's kind of how Lady Poetesses from Hell got started yes Jane has read with the Lady Poetesses too. Yes, she has. I remember her fish hat. She's a nice dark twisted poet too. <laughs> yeah. um, so when writing the poetry, you have to spend so much, you pay so much attention to each word. Um, do you bring the same kind of attention to writing short fiction? Um, I don't start out like with an outline and just mm -hmm. then fill it in. Um, and I, I. I use kind of a what I call thinking with my fingers because I don't know what's going to come up next necessarily and so as I'm reading I'm going oh wow cool I didn't know that was going to happen um, so my drafts end up I, not that I don't rewrite because I definitely do and I mm -hmm. have writers groups I'm a member of several different writers groups and I definitely recommend a critique group to people because for one thing, there are, it's the external deadline, and then you get that feedback, and you actually learn as much or more on working with another writer's work as you do on trying to work on your own. So you can then translate those. So I think because you're giving, you receive them there too. But So I do spend a 
fair amount of time on the first draft, um, mm -hmm. and it, it comes out pretty good. And then, of course, I do tweak it. Um, but I don't. And some of my poems just come out the way I want them. For example, with Egg Horror Poem, I actually wrote it on an egg at Easter time. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. and uh, we were decorating eggs when my kids were much mm -hmm. younger. And um, yeah, I wrote this little story. I had to write continued on next egg. And then I put in line breaks because I thought, wow, that's pretty cool. And it, it was pretty much the way it, I, I don't think I changed that at all. But of course, some poems and, and certain bits of short fiction and novels do get reworked a lot. So it varies. Some things are just gifts from the universe. <laughs> Did you move into writing short fiction after you'd had some success with the poems, or had you been writing short fiction since you were 12 or something? I had not really got had so much work on the short fiction, um, but I hadn't really had that much published in the way of poetry either. The, the poetry and the fiction kind of started being published around the same time. So um, when I started writing short fiction, I, it was fairly lame you know, oh, you know, way, way flowery language and lots of, you, you shudder to think of it, but you, you have to start where you are. Mm -hmm. and then Is that what the writing groups kind of? They help a great deal with that sort of thing. And, and, so, and some of the rejection slips from editors are oh. really good for that too. That might be. <laughs> um, so you won the World Fantasy Award for Sky Eyes. How many stories had you done by that point? Well, that was my ninth story that had been sold, uh, bought by the magazine of fantasy and science fiction. Mm -hmm. And I'd had other stories published in, in uh, other genre publications like Tales of the Unanticipated. And, oh, I had a mini mystery in Woman's World, for mm -hmm. example, a long time ago. But uh, so Sky Eyes was my ninth sale to the magazine of fantasy and science fiction. And... Uh, I went to the World Fantasy Convention in Corpus Christi, and Eleanor Arneson was on the ballot the same year, on mm -hmm. the short story ballot. So um, I had gotten her comments if she won, and, and so I wrote her comments on one side and mine on the other. And when she didn't win, I just set the paper down because I thought, well, I'm not going to need this now. And when they called my name, I, I tied for best novella. And when they called my name, I just I got up there and I said, I haven't been this surprised since I got nominated <laughs> in my speech, but, but that was a lot of fun. And mm -hmm. uh, so I've got the World Fantasy Award is is um, H.P. Lovecraft in pewter as envisioned by Gay and Wilson and big bulgy eyes and mm -hmm. he looks better with sunglasses or you know, a big cowboy hat or something. <laughs> Mine's dressed up with, I think I have a little shower cap on him right now He's sitting in my windowsill. So. What's Sky Eyes about? Sky Eyes is about a young girl who has, um, who essentially is forced to poison her mother because her mother is very, very sick and she goes to the local witch woman to get some medicine and, and um, the medicine is for easing the pain but it doesn't completely ease it and if you give too much then mm -hmm. it, it ends the life and her father essentially makes her do it and then blames her for it and, and abandons her. And so she goes and lives with the witch woman and is raised by her and um, develops some psychic abilities of her own. Um, it's a, I, I really like this story mm -hmm. myself, so I was happy that it won. Now you said in the notes to um, Growing Wings that Growing Wings started out as a short story that just Oh. Kept going. <laughs> yes. It, it was one of these, this is the hardcover copy. It was, it's in hardcover from uh, Houghton Mifflin. But the, um, I, I started writing. I had this idea, of just like a bare fragment of an idea about a girl who, whose mother came into the bedroom to check her back and see if she was growing wings. And she'd been doing this for years and thought the girl didn't know, but the girl, you know, was paying attention. Mm -hmm. And, of course... It starts, you know, when she is beginning to grow wings. And they, um, I thought, okay, you know, beginning of the short story, but now where am I going? What am I going to do? Because I wrote about, oh, 5,000 words, and then I got stuck. And I'm doing brainstorm. It's like, well, they could go there, and she could do that, and they could, and I'm like, ah, if they do all those things, it's a novel. Ah, run away. <laughs> 
But I, I decided, okay, maybe you can write a novel. It'll be hard and scary, but you can do it. And it wasn't so bad. It wasn't so bad. So I, I got the first five pages seen at a Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators conference. And the editor said some nice things about it. And I, so I went up afterwards and, and said, I'm the one that wrote that. Will you look at it when I finish? And she said, sure. Mm -hmm. And then when I showed it to her, the first ending was totally lame. I mean, I'm just, because I was afraid of writing novels, I, I just wrote for a while. And then I decided, oh, well, here's a, it should end now. So, you know, here's half a page that means it's, mm -hmm. end, it's over. So <laughs> when I sent it to her and she said, well, the ending's a little bit abrupt, <laughs> but and she gave me some ideas, and she said, but she said, if you if you're willing to to work on it, I will take another look. So, which was fortunate because a lot of editors just say, eh, yeah, she didn't pull it off. Oh well. So I was I was lucky. She's she's a goddess, and and my paperback editor Sharon November at Puffin is, the, she does the Firebird line, mm -hmm. wonderful wonderful books, and um, she's. Another goddess. She edited the and anthology, And she edited, right? what a nice segue, the Firebirds anthology. I've got to show this cover because it's so cool, the way they've done it. What's your story in Firebirds? Uh, the story in Firebirds is called The Flying Woman. Uh, you might think I've got some sort of thing <laughs> with wings here going on, but um, it's about two children who are banished from their community because through their um, dead mother, who was a member of another community, they have magical abilities. And, you know, it's not okay to have magical abilities, so they're banished to this island and, in which a, a flying woman comes. And so it's kind of the trials and tribulations of the, the young girl, who's the viewpoint character, and her older brother, who develops mm -hmm. an extreme fascination for this flying woman and wants to keep her, even though it is not in her best interest to be kept. <laughs> so... Um, there's a lot of good fiction in this anthology. So. Any of the other stories you like in particular? Oh, I, I can't begin to start. I mean, the, just it's like a who's who. I mean, there's Lloyd Alexander and uh, Nancy Farmer, Patricia McKillop, and Nancy Springer, just some uh, Nina Kariki Hoffman. It's just some excellent, excellent. Mm -hmm. And Emma Bull and Charles Bess. So, a local connection there. So... Excellent book. Well, let's go back to Growing Wings. Okay. Um, what uh, kinds of responses have you gotten? Uh, I've had just some lovely responses from Growing Wings. Uh, as a matter of fact, there's a, a, a girls' school in California who did a whole curriculum unit around this book. They, they did um, like a mock trial mm -hmm. where they tried... Um, the characters for the character f prosecuted and defended her for cutting her daughter's wings off. The oh, okay. Lynette's mother. Mm -hmm. So, so Lynette's grandmother was put on trial uh, at at this school, and and then all the girls wrote me letters, and some of them wrote poetry for me, and I I started reading these things, and I you know I mean some of them made me cry, and I I get periodic emails from girls, mainly girls, some mm -hmm. boys, but mainly girls, because al almost all the characters in the book are girls. And some of them say things like, you changed my life. Whoa. <laughs> Do you think that um, the, the whole kind of scary thing about the wings, the, um, the mention early on that it's, you know, it it's becomes with puberty and her mother blushes, and um, the girl is... is cognizant, Leonard is cognizant that she's very flat chested, at least mm -hmm, at this point mm -hmm, yet. Mm -hmm. um, certainly the growing wings is, is kind of a metaphor for going through puberty. Yeah, you can And I wonder if maybe it's kind of particularly for girls. You know, that's possible. Um, you know, I, of course, have had no experience other than the fact that I have two sons, but mm -hmm. that's not the same thing as experiencing it yourself. Um, and it is, there, there are such big changes. Um, you can read it, you know, metaphorically, both in terms of puberty or just in terms of just taking your own inner magic and going outward with it. You know, I mean, 
letting your your hidden self free in whatever way that is. Mm -hmm. So. Well, surely that's a, a metaphor for, aside from physical puberty, for the whole experience of, of what do you call it, high school, I guess, mm. later well, grades, at, upper, in, at upper any, middle school. Well, at any point, you can have this experience. I, you know, I'm having it right now. I just recently got a divorce, and I've got, you know, children graduating from high school, and I'm going to be, you know, off on my own wings, so mm -hmm. to speak, myself. Um, I think it's valuable sort of message for, for any point. Um, let's talk a little bit about what your future plans for writing are. Um, you have a couple of other books on the drawing yeah. boards or, or in I'm process. I'm excited about those. <laughs> and um, I think you told me that your, your next book will probably be Do Not Attempt This at School, for which you received the McKnight Artist Fellowship for Children's Fiction. Yes. I. Um, I was working on another novel, which is very complicated. It has four viewpoint characters and three dead characters and two time periods. And my computer was acting up. And so I you know, quick shut that down and thought, OK, I can't work on this for a minute. Let's brainstorm on another book. And let's make it simple. Let's make the whole thing happen in one week. Let's have one main character just <laughs> Let's have it be about stuff I already know about, you know, boys going to high school. Because <laughs> I have twin sons who are mm -hmm. seniors this year. So I, made, I outlined this story about a 10th grade geek boy who is, whose parents have just got divorced. Well, there's another parallel here. Uh, and um, he heads off for his first, first day of 10th grade at a new school. And then he and his mother have just moved, and all of his shoes are packed somewhere, you know. You mentioned you couldn't find your copy of Growing Wings because it's packed in boxes because you, you're just going through this, too. So he, um, his mother finds one pair of shoes, like the, the wing tips he wore to his second cousin's wedding uh, the, following, the previous summer. And so he, has, he misses the bus. He's late to school. He's wearing wing tips, and it gets worse from there. So the, the, I submitted a 20-page segment of that for the McKnight it was day two, Cowboy Josh and the Underwear of Doom. <laughs> and uh, that, and I won. Um, and I was actually, it was kind of a reward for a decision I'd made because I, I just dropped out of massage school. I was be going to become a massage therapist. And after the first two months of the professional program, I looked and I had written exactly 1,100 words on my novel, which is about five pages, mm -hmm. um, four, oh, not, not even five pages, a little over four, which is not a really good two-month output on a novel. No. And I had, my editor was waiting for it, and I thought, you know, this is not going to work. So I dropped out, and in the next two months, I wrote 11,000 words, finished the draft of the novel, and entered it in the, the McKnight. And so then the following February, I found out I won. So... That was a pretty clear message from the universe. Yep, this is where your focus needs needs to be. And I, I have finished that novel, and um, my agent has seen it. My editor has seen it. It has some uh, some problems because it's a little episodic. It needs to mm -hmm. to get a little bit more rising action, such. Uh, so I know how to fix that one. But in the meantime, I'd started writing another new one called The Secret Life of Suzuki, England, which is about a girl who her poor mother dies in the first thousand words. And I really love this woman, too, so it was hard to kill her. But um, she had to go, <laughs> <laughs> can I say? And then poor Suzuki, England, is you know cast off into the world, 14 years old. And she discovers quite early on that she's three quarters elf. And then and meet some of some aunts of hers who are elves and and not everyone of no one really seems to have her best interest at heart there are things going on that, mm -hmm. that she feels pretty powerless about so she goes on the run again from the elves and from the police and from you know cuz she's basically a runaway mm -hmm. and so She's trying to figure out how to use her magic and how to stay undetected and how to, you know, where to go and what to do. And so 
And I'm, I'm just at the end of, of that first draft. It's very exciting. I may finish it off tomorrow. Oh, wow. <laughs> I, Really? <laughs> I mean, this close. <laughs> now, is uh, Do Not Attempt This at School of Fantasy also, or is that a more realistic story? It's more realistic, although throughout I have things like messages from the universe and you know the universe seems to kind of be a really contributing entity in in Josh's life uh, and there are oh you know there, there's one point in it where we see things through the point of view of a mouse and you know <laughs> so it's not it's it's more realistic but it's not standard reality it so. sounds pretty humorous it's I think it's very funny. I, I had so much fun writing that novel. I, I would just laugh out loud myself. So I think that it's really important for an author to, when people ask me what age level do I write for, I say mine, <laughs> you know, whatever that may be at the time. And I just actually wrote a picture book, too. I, I took a trip to Peru in January. That was one of the things I did with my McKnight money. And while I was there, one of the women on the trip had just wonderful curly hair that the wind just loved mm -hmm. to play with, just wild and crazy. Her name was Julie. So I wrote a picture book manuscript called Julie's Hair that is off with my editor now. So I haven't heard back on that yet. Okay. But well, I hope they find a good illustrator. Or are you going to illustrate it too? No, I am an artist, but I am... I'm not the sort, the sort of artist who can make the character look the same on every page. You know, mm -hmm. I, it's like kind of one-shot art. It's like, oh, this one, this looks good. But if you ask me to, to recreate that character in different, differing poses, that's so beyond my capabilities. So, okay. <laughs> um, now, you've also written adult fiction. What's the difference between writing for adults and children? You said you just write for your, your own age, but... Uh... Yeah, um, I don't find a lot of difference in writing for adults and children. And I think that's partly because of my uh, high respect for the intelligence and abilities of children. So I don't uh, I don't try to 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 simplify vocabulary mm -hmm. and such too much in my children's fiction because when I was a kid, you know, I I liked big words and I yeah, I mean fun words and and uh, so I. It's not so much a difference in, in thinking of, oh, this is for adults, this is for children. It's just like, well, this story needs to be a picture book. And um, as an adult who loves picture books, mm -hmm. I'm not just thinking, oh, this is a story for little kids. I mean, this is just an illustrated short story with a few words. So I don't do a lot of time deciding, making distinctions on... Uh, well, let's see, we need a third grade reading level here, so we'll have to um, uh, put, you know, five word sentences instead of ten word sentences. I mean, and this could happen, be, uh, have something to do with the fact that, you know, my children, very precocious young children, and have always liked complex fiction and, and, and spoken very well and had large mm -hmm. vocabularies. So I think of kids as, you know, intelligent beings. <laughs> A lot of people don't, but... Now, um, one thing I'd been wondering about is you mentioned the thanks to your parents for letting you buy all those books from the book club when you were growing up in Montana in your mm -hmm. one-room school. Mm -hmm. um, what books did you read that were particularly inspiring to you then? When I was a kid, I read pretty much anything I could get my hands on. I read horse books. I read westerns. I read historicals. I read... <clears throat> there wasn't a lot of science fiction and fantasy available in my library at, at the school. Or... Um, uh, I, my second cousin's wife, Catherine is just, you know, near and dear to my heart because she introduced me to three really important things. Heinlein, uh, the, mm -hmm. both the, uh, a couple of the juveniles, but mainly like, I think Stranger in a Strange Land and Time Enough for Love were the first Heinlein books I ever read. So I did not get started on Half Spaceship Well Traveled. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
They're really not children's and, books. And, <laughs> and she also introduced me to Tolkien. Mm -hmm. So that, I think it was about when I was in eighth grade. And um, I think I've read the trilogy nine times now. So it was very exciting to see the movies. And then she also introduced me to tea, which is a huge passion in my life, you know. It's like, if, if I run out of tea, I am so out there grocery shopping because I can run out of anything else but not tea. <laughs> um, so, uh, and I mean, my grandma read Harlequin romances, so I read those, mm -hmm. and a family friend read the Louis L'Amour books, and we had some Zane Graves, and so it pretty much didn't matter. If there were books available, I read them, and oh, the first summer my dad worked construction so we traveled around a lot so the first um, uh, summer I was actually in a town with a library within walking distance it was big timber Montana and I would go out and I'd get a big stack of books like this and, and carry it home and I'm a very fast reader so I would whip through them and I'd take them back to the library and and uh, get some more I read all the Tarzan books that summer, and mm -hmm. oh, it was very exciting. <laughs> so, and I still, I think uh, YA and middle grade fiction is pretty much still my favorite s stuff to read, as well as, well, okay, I, I said I, I was over my fear of novels, more or less, mm -hmm. but that, that just extends to children's fiction because I'm still deathly afraid of adult novels that would, you know, be come in at, you know, 100,000 words or something. Good at about half that. <laughs> well, I hope you can keep on writing more children's books, and we'll be looking forward to Do Not Attempt This at School in about a year, I suppose. I'm, I'm hoping to get that out, you know, right away, and then, like you said, it takes about a year in the publishing project. And um, I, uh, I have to thank your daughter, Claire, too, online or on the air, though, because you asked her if, if she wanted me to write a sequel, and she said, you know, you know, she left it open, so, and and I want to see what else she's writing, so. <laughs> so you haven't gone back you, to a Claire. sequel. Well, and I, I, I do not rule that out, mm -hmm. but um, it, it would have to be something that really spontaneously occurred, because I wouldn't want it to be something that, that didn't work. So. Well, we've been talking today on TV Bookshelf, and we're looking forward to more work from Laurel Winter, both poetry and magazines like Asimov's, and more books like Growing Wings. And, uh... Well, it's been very fun, and, and uh, thank you very much. Appreciate yeah. it. Thank you.